Please put your hands together and give a big, warm Liverpool welcome to James Marsters! Yay! Hello, Lord. Give it up one more time for James Marsters! Hello, you beautiful people. They are a beautiful oh. crowd, aren't they? They're a beautiful hey, crowd. Before we get started, could I, could I ask a favor? Of course. I, um, I like to take a, a small video of anyone cosplaying uh, from anything that I've been in or has a, like a tattoo, Buffy tattoo or something. Uh, and then I string that together and put it on social media. But I'd like to give them um, a big round of applause in the little video afterwards. Where, uh, and that's where you guys come in, if you don't mind. Like, so when I say action, can you guys like raise your arms and scream like your, your team won the binky or whatever you guys play for around here? Is that cool? It's an acting cool? challenge. You up for it, guys? Yeah. All right. Okay. Super easy. Okay, ready? Oh, they're naturals. Y'all are going to make it in Hollywood. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you for that. <laughs> Liverpool is such a fun crowd. First of all, I am so thrilled to have you here because we've had some great interviews before. But I will tell you what, Liverpool is a different crowd. They're a rowdy crowd. They know how to party. How have you been enjoying Liverpool Comic Con so far, Jason? I love it. I mean, first of all, I love conventions in general. Yeah. Like I find all over the world, everyone's beautiful, everyone's safe, and you can be whatever you want to be. It's like heaven. Yeah, but like Liverpool reminds me of like Austin, Texas or Seattle, Washington in the States because like everyone who lives in Seattle or Austin, they love it. Like yeah. they're, they're not moving anywhere. They're like, it's right here. We don't have to look for it elsewhere. Like Liverpool rocks. Yeah. It really does. And you've seen a lot of the UK, by the way. So I've seen you in so many different places with Monopoly events and all of the fans have been amazing. But have you had a chance to really like get to see Liverpool, Cavern Club, Beatles, you know, all of the, the nostalgia that's here? Yeah, I played, I played the Cavern uh, with my band. Uh, not my band, but the band I'm in. And then I played it solo. Uh, but I went to the Beatles uh, Museum Friday and found out that the Cavern Club that I played in wasn't the same one that the Beatles played in. You all know that. I was like, what? <laughs> Somebody lied to you. Well, no, it fell down or it got ripped down or they, so they, just, you know, they, they demolished the, the original. Yeah. So they rebuilt it and the, the acoustics are still great. But yeah, so I've, I've been this, I think it was my third time to Liverpool. Uh, but yeah, I got to walk around on Friday. That was cool. I love that. Well, tell us more about your music because obviously, you know, a lot of the actors that we talk to are multifaceted. They do a lot of amazing things, philanthropy, music, things like that. So how does the, the musician side of you uh, coexist with the actor side of you? Get uh, real deep here on the Oprah couch. Yeah, I was, I, I was playing in bars when I was 13. Um, it was a great way to get into bars. Is that loud? <laughs> Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> 13. Well, yeah. I mean, like, I was a musician, so it's okay, okay. I guess. Um, and I was only playing James Taylor. I refused to play anyone but James Taylor. I had my nose in the air. Um, but then, you know, I decided to, to, to study acting in college and really kind of pursue that. And for a long time, my guitar kind of went into my private life. Uh, and then after uh, Buffy was being filmed, I, was, I did an interview and, and uh, they asked me if I played an instrument and I said, yeah, guitar. And someone who had a club in LA read that because I got a call, do you want to play 14 Below in Santa Monica? And they must have figured like, it does not matter if this guy's any good. Like if we, he's on television, so if we get him in the club, he's going to sell tickets, we're going to make money, it'll be fine. And I went there and sure enough, I wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, and I knew it, you know, but I had fun and I, and I thought if I keep doing this, I'll probably get better. You know, it, it's all about practice. So um, for about a year and a half, I was doing like big clubs, like the biggest clubs in LA and I was terrible. <laughs> and I remember I was playing the Key Club, which is like the biggest club in LA. And they come backstage to me and they're like, dude, Pink is in the audience. She can't wait to hear you. And I was just like, oh. 
Oh my God, no pressure. What? Pink. Oh, no, no. It's a nightmare, man. And sure enough, by the end of the show, Pink was nowhere to be seen. She like took off, like, she, ah, you know. Um, but then uh, I met a 17, 18-year-old kid who had come to L.A. to sell his album. He was part of a, he had a, um, a rock band in Sacramento that was getting airplay up there uh, called Power Animal. And uh, he was trying to sell their album and just hitting a wall in L.A. Couldn't get, couldn't get anyone to listen to him, but it was a really good album. We started a band. And uh, we formed and cut an album within a month and then we toured it like right away. Wow. Uh, and it kind of took off. It, it went really well, actually. Yeah. Uh, primarily because everybody else in the band was like really good. And I'm a pretty good singer, so like, like it, it worked out pretty good. For sure, yeah. yes. Well, if you guys are new to this experience here, we'd love to get interactive with our fans. So we do have microphones here. Number one is here on the right. We've got number two on the left. And then up top, we've got number three and four. But a question for me before we go to the fans. Obviously, Liverpool is so much fun. The fans here are amazing. But with your illustrious career as you've had, how amazing is it that your, your career kind of spans the globe, right? Because I'm sure you've had very well-traveled experiences and people know you all over the world. What's that been like, fan experience-wise? Really good. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, like, I don't know. I still pinch myself and be like, how did I get here? Yeah. You know, like, what door did I walk through that now I'm living this life? Because I was like a really poor theater actor for a long time. Yeah. And I was in my mid-30s, and I had had a son. Well, I didn't have, you know, I was part of the process, but uh, Involved, I was a yeah. father for the first time. <laughs> And uh, I realized that I had to try to make money, you know, and, and theater, I was very successful in theater, but you don't make any money, certainly not enough to be a parent. And so I came down to, to Los Angeles to basically prostitute myself, you know, yeah. and I ended up on, on Buffy, which is amazing. And suddenly, <laughs> hi, here I am. So yeah, it's just, I, I still pinch myself. I don't know how to answer the question. Yeah. It's surreal to this day. Yeah. No, we love it because you're so humble about it. But obviously, I mean, your career spans the globe. We're here in Liverpool, and the fans love you in Liverpool. And of By the course, way, yeah. yes. You guys can ask me anything that you want. Like, I am shameless. Try to embarrass me. I dare you. Bring it. I love but the I don't necessarily it. promise to answer anything that you ask me. But I mean, like, try it. Whatever. It's good. Yeah. Just throwing down the gauntlet. Just yeah. it's there. He will answer. And again, I told you guys, I did pre-warn them not to like no pressure, but I was like, this is gonna be so much fun because you're so candid with the audience and so amazing with the fans. So let's get right to you guys because here at Monopoly, it's not about me fangirling, which I will do. It's about y'all. So let's get to microphone number one. We have a beautiful princess on your right that would like to ask you a question. <laughs> hey, hey. Hi, James. Hello. Um, my name's Courtney. Um, I grew up watching Buffy um, as my mom was, is still a massive fan of yours. Like, she had posters and collectibles of you all over the house. Like, I couldn't get away from your face. It was oh. insane. <laughs> so I'm I, so sorry. <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, um, she can't be here at the moment. Um, so I kind of want to ask a question. Um, her name's Christina, um, just kind of for me and for her. Um, basically, what was the most like memorable um, moment that you had on the show? <laughs> Sorry. Wow. <laughs> there were so many. I mean, like, yeah. like uh, it, it was heaven. Every time, they said, every time they said action, I was in heaven. Yeah. And every time they said cut, I was like, damn it, you know, I have to come back down to earth because the, like the writing was just amazing. I mean, um, I remember shooting the very first scene uh, and it worked like right away. It was, it, was like a, it was like getting into a car that I knew how to drive like right away. Like there are some, usually with a character, it takes you about a day, a day and a half to kind of figure out where all the levers are and where the gas pedal is and all of that. With Spike, it was just right away. I was like, oh yeah, let's race. Let's go. Um, and I kind of realized, I don't think I'm going to be poor anymore, at least for a little <laughs> while, you know, because they said, you're going to do at least five or ten episodes. If we like you, it'll be ten. If we don't like you, it'll probably be five, you know, we'll kill you off quickly. But 
it worked. Like the very first scene worked really well. And so I was like, I'm going to get 10, baby. I'm going to feed my family for like a year on this shit. You know? Well, my mom bought you pretty much all out with the collectibles. So yeah, <laughs> that's understandable. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Great question. Got a question over here. Microphone number two on the left. Hi there. Hello. Um, my name's Robin. And just like the... Um, person before, my mum was a massive, massive fan of you. Same here. Um, but 21 years ago, um, she saw you for the first time when she was 13. Um, and she wanted me to ask you before I asked my question, yeah. if you could just say, hi, Amy. She's right at the front row. Hey, oh. Amy. <laughs> Great cosplay. You look good after 13 years, babe. <laughs> Um, so my question was, you mentioned your band, and I just wanted to know, what was the highlight of Ghost of the Robot for you? <laughs> it's so hard to say, man. Like, like one of the highlights was, um, I produced the first album, because only I had enough money to do it. Like, they're all like... 17 years old, you know, and I'm on Buffy, so like, I'll pay for the first job. But like, I, um, I was a theater producer in Chicago and Seattle, so I had produced artists before. And I had learned that the best way to do it is you get really talented people in the same room and then pressure them to go quick and deny them a lot of money. Like, don't let, because they'll get lazy, they'll get, like, like the, the, the creativity doesn't really pop unless they're kind of semi-panicked, frankly. Um, so I just kept going, you know, like, like, they were like, we need another take, we need another, and I'm like, no, keep going. You got one more, nope, we're, we're moving on to the next song. And they hated me, <laughs> hated me. But we got, like, a really kind of ferocious energetic, dirty rock album out of it. And I was really, that's, so, that's kind of a high point for me as a producer, like to know how, to be the worst musician, but also know how to get the best music out of, these, out of this situation. That was kind of cool. Um, I remember playing for like, we played for 5,000 people in Berlin. That was amazing. Uh, we, we played for like five, 7,000 quite a few times and I got to say like that you can see why rock stars go weird you know because like the temptation for the ego to take off when that many people are screaming and excited about what you're doing your ego can start screaming that you're really cool you know which is like very dangerous, you know, like my, my ego is the part of me that wants to me to be lonely. Hmm? My, my ego is the part that wants me to be disconnected from other people, either by feeling like I'm better than they are or worse than they are or I'm not getting my way or whatever it is. Um, and it fights what makes me happy, which is to be connected with other people. But I'm like, so I don't know if that's a high point, but it was really, in, like those shows were really intense. Oh, Thank you. Yay. That is one of the high points of my life. Yeah. <laughs> there it is. Yeah, so that's, that's what I got for now. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. That's a great analogy about the ego. Very deep. This is what happens at the Oprah Winfrey set. This is where we get very deep. You might start crying at some point. We'll see what happens. We have a question up at the top right. Hello there, number three uh, up at the top. Hiya. Hi, my name's Ava. Um, hey, Ava. Hello. <laughs> My mom has been watching you since she was my age, 13. <laughs> She's been obsessing over you. Can you just say hi, Angela, to her? Hello, Angela. I'm giving you my fake sexy British accent and everything. <laughs> yeah. So what is it with you? Your mothers, you just put your daughters up to it. Yeah. You don't want to stand at a microphone. What's up? Um, my question is, during your whole acting career, what has been the most surprise to you? <laughs> Liverpool with the, with the thinker questions. Y'all are on point today. You came to play. Sorry. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that without sounding really 
too confident. Oh, it's all friends here. So you can sound weird. Confident. Like, yeah. okay, like I, I've known that I wanted to be an actor since I was like very little, you know, like nine years old. Um, and I remember they interviewed me in my high school, the high school newspaper interviewed me and they're like, what are your plans? And I was like, my plan is that I want to go to Santa Monica Pacific Conservatory and then on to Juilliard. And then I want to do regional theater. And then after that, I think I want to do Hollywood maybe. We'll see. And that's exactly what I did. <laughs> like, that is so weird. That, like, I, I remember I, 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 I saw this article years later and I read it. I was like, Jesus Christ, I knew exactly what I was going to be doing. I knew that Buffy was going to last because I'm a Star Trek fan. <laughs> and I knew... Right? I'm in like an OG Star Trek fan. And like I've seen like the, I've seen those episodes like 30 times. I know exactly what they're gonna say. I know exactly what's gonna happen. But I still go back to that world. There's something about that world that I want to go back to. It makes me feel good. And I think it's because that original series was selling hope. You know? Like we don't have to blow ourselves up. We might survive ourselves and graduate, kind of. Um, and and I kind of sensed that Buffy was, Buffy was creating a world that might be doing that too. Like it might be so, so fun to be in Sunnydale that people might want to return to it even though they know what's going to happen. And I, I remember, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning and I went to the, my fellow castmates and I was like, guys, we may be talking about this scene for the rest of our lives. Anyone want a cup of coffee? <laughs> uh, and so I kind of knew that. What do I... I don't know. I guess I, I am surprised that it all went so well, I guess. I don't know how to answer your question. You've embarrassed me. You did it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have to ask now, you being a big Trekkie, as it were, a Star Trek fan, have you at Comic Cons, for example, met any of your Star Trek heroes oh before? Oh my God, yes. I met How'd oh it go? Oh my God, horribly. <laughs> oh, yay! I mean, so bad, man. Like, I met Leonard Nimoy. He's the nicest person, or was. And I was just like, hi, man, hi, man, hi, man, hi, man, hi, man, like that. <laughs> and that was when I was a kid. And then I met him again in the green room when I was on Buffy. And like, he was put into a separate green room, probably because even in the green room, people are all over him, because everyone's a fan of Spock, you know. So in order for him to get a rest, and the dude was like 65, 70 years old, he wanted to rest. And they put me in the same room with him. And it was like my second convention of my life. I didn't understand how tired you could get, and that, that, that you know, Leonard might really want 10 minutes to rest, you know. And I just like went, hi, I'm your biggest fan. How you doing? And he was just like, <sighs> you know. Like. Oh, no. And from that, from that time on, I had to avoid, avoid him. Yeah. I just was like, I'm not going to bother him. I'm not even going to look at him. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I can't be cool. But it's great for us to hear stories like that because we're all here as fans to meet our favorites such as you. So, again, give it up for James Marsters. My goodness. <laughs> for sharing that, that fan story because we all have them for sure. Very relatable. We're gonna go to uh, microphone number four up at the top left. Hello, sir. Hi, James. Hey, brother. Uh, I'm Griff. Right on, Griff. Yeah, um, I, I love you in your TV shows, Buffy, Torchwood, Smallville. They're all good. But I appreciate your vocal talent more in the Dresden series of audiobooks. We met yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just wondering, would you, if they do it in the future, be willing to be in another TV show of Dresden? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, what future projects are on the horizon for you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I would love to do. I would, I would hope if they did Dresden that they would give it enough money to do it properly, you know? Um, I don't know who I would play. I'm not tall enough for Harry Dresden. But, oh. <laughs> well, you know, like if, if who, who did Lord of the Rings? You know, like, they'd have to Gandalf me, yeah. you know? They'd have to make me look really taller than other people. Really? But I mean, you can do anything with money, I guess. Um, shit, 
What was your, Griff, what was your other question? What was the second part of that? <laughs> oh, projects. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I am currently doing uh, a project with DreamWorks uh, for Apple Plus, but I can't talk about it. Except to say that the producers came up to me and they're like, your character is popping. He's like the star of the show. Oh, my God. <laughs> so it's going very well. Um, uh, and then uh, Ghost of the Robot, the band that I'm in, uh, we're back in the studio in January. So we're going we're gonna to do a new album. Yeah. Love to hear that. Very exciting. We've got a question at microphone number one here on the right. Hi there. Hello. Uh, my name's Holly. Hey, Holly. Uh, um, my question is, where did you learn to do the British accent and how was it to get into whilst you were playing it? Well, you know, I watched a lot of Monty Python as a, you know, when I was younger. But um, it wasn't that great, really. It's probably not too good right now. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think, you know, like I go back to, to, to School Hard and the first few episodes and it's not, it's, it's not so nice. It's not so great, you know. Um, but then... I said the word bullock as bullock because it was, the script was written by an American and they spelled it B-U-L-L hyphen L-O-C-K-S, bullocks. And I was like, okay, bullocks. And Tony Head came up to me after he saw it and he's like, we don't say it like that, you prat. You're embarrassing me back home. So I'm going to help you right now. So he would come and tutor me by force. <laughs> he would come in, he would, the new script would come, and sure enough, Tony would come through my door, uh, and he wouldn't knock. He's like, it's time. And we would go through the script line by line until he was satisfied that I wasn't going to embarrass him anymore. And, and I think it, if he hadn't done that, I don't know that I would have fooled anybody in the long run. Uh, but then it really kind of, it sunk in when I visited the UK and I started getting the rhythm of the language more. Because uh, that's, the, the, the sounds are one thing, but getting the rhythm of a new language, is the, that's when it really kind of clicks. But yeah, it's Tony Head, basically. Yeah. yeah. Thank Good you. question. Yeah. yeah, it's sort of like an inflection over here, right? It's like, da-da-da-da, everything's a little, you know, the inflection, yeah. <laughs> Been here a while, it's interesting. We have a question over here uh, at number two, the microphone here on the left. Hi, I'm Sam. Hey, Sam. Um, Sarah Michelle Gellar, in a recent interview, said that if they were going to reboot Buffy, that she'd want Zendaya to play Buffy. Who would you want to play Spike? Ooh. And would you come back as Giles if they asked you to? <laughs> <laughs> well, that, like, I think the best idea is to not recast Buffy, to not recast Spike, and just let there be a new slayer for a new generation. And just do a new one. And Zendaya would be great. She'd be fabulous. I think that's a great idea. Um, but if they did that, it would be funny to have Spike be the, the watcher. And just have him be horrible to it. No, no, you're terrible. Do it again. Oh, my God, you're boring me. You know? That would be kind of funny, actually. But, um, but I, you know, like Spike's a vampire, man. And he doesn't age. And I'm human. So... <laughs> You know, like, you don't want to be like, wow, Spike looks really good for his age. Like, no. The only funny thing is for Spike looks exactly the same as he did in 2001. He's like, you people look terrible. What, are you tired? What happened to you? You know, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Great question. You guys are awesome. We've got a question up here at the top, uh, number three, up on the right. Hello, sir. Hi, I'm Mike. Yeah, hey, Mike. Uh, what would the conversation be like between Spike and Zamasu? <laughs> what would that be like? Oh, you puny mortal. I'm not mortal, I'm a vampire. What's a vampire? Oh, forget it, you never understand. <laughs> Love it, thank you, sir. We've got a question here up on uh, the top left. Microphone number four, hi there. Hi, uh, so one of my favorite episodes is Once More We're Feeling. I was yeah. wondering, do you still know the lyrics to Rest in Peace and can you sing it? 
No, uh, no, I don't do it anymore. I don't. Let me rest in peace. Let me get some sleep. Let me take my love and bury it. In a hole six foot deep, I can lay my body down, but I can't find my sweet release. Let me rest in peace. <laughs> Liverpool is putting it's you on so the spot. It's so easy to make people happy when you've been on television. There you go. You're doing it well. We've got a question over here. Microphone. Thank you for that. We've got a question here at microphone number one on the right. Hi there. Hey, Hi. Spike. Hello. Uh, I'm Jace. Hey, Jace. Hi. Um, I was wondering, um, what's your favorite line that Spike said in Buffy? Wow, so many. Sorry. <laughs> so many. Uh, out for a walk. Yeah. <laughs> a bear! You made a bear! Undo it! Undo it! <laughs> Bite me. You know, <laughs> the standard ones. Yeah. What's your favorite? Oh, God. Um, uh, I think um, any time. Uh, you're a wee bloody puppet man. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's an angel, but it's still Spike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Thank man. You. A lot of zingers, a lot of zingers to choose from. We've got a question over here at microphone number two on the left. Hello. Hi, um, I forgot my name for a second. I'm Alex. <laughs> hey, Alex. <laughs> the um, last person beat me to my original question, but I'm an aspiring actor, and I want from your information um, and your advice, what would you give to... Any other Inspire actor, what would um, you do? Yeah, yeah. Um, every human being is beautiful enough and interesting enough to be stared at. Every single one of us. And the irony is, actors like myself, we tend to cover up the most interesting and beautiful sides of ourselves by trying to be interesting and beautiful. By trying to be cool. Or trying to give the audience what we think they want as opposed to the truth, which is always kind of weird. Like human beings are fascinating because we're so weird, you know? Um, the thing, that, the thing that, uh, that, that actors give the audience, the big gift is that we allow the audience to stare at us, to study us. Um, it's the only time that we can really do that, you know? Like people watching, is very interesting because people are weird, you know, and they're very interesting to watch. But when you're people watching, you're watching someone who knows they might be being studied because they're out in public. What's more fun is doing the peeping Tom thing. <laughs> when you're looking at someone who doesn't know, who is certain that they're private. Now, but if you do that, you go to jail. So don't do that. <laughs> but we actors... We give, the sec we, we give them something very close to them. We give the audience, like, I will be private in public, you know? And it's a big gift, but because it's rude. Like, if you study someone, if you sit down at a bar and just be like, <laughs> you're going to get into a fight, you know? So we allow people to stare. Uh, but it's not, it's not easy because the only time that predators stare at each other and we are predators we have forward facing eyes not like a cow you know like if a cow stares at you I'm like I don't care stare you know but forward facing eyes when they lock onto me I have a fight flight reaction and so when 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 this many eyes are are locking on there's like get out of here you know there's a there's a stage fright thing and I have to get over that and so it is a big gift to allow that. And, and the trick for me is to overcome that fight flight thing, to not try to um, protect myself and armor up with a false James, but to, to take all that fear, conquer it, and reveal myself as I really am and let them see the real weird me. And if I can, yeah. That's the trick. It's a little mountain I climb every time, and I'm not that good at it. I, I think there are probably five or ten actors on the planet who really do this perfectly every time, and they always remind me how wonderful human beings are and how proud I am to be one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful answer. Thank you for that. 
Joaquin Phoenix is one of them for me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Weird and really interesting. Yeah. Beautifully weird, yeah. So your inner monologue goes, get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I, I've been in front of a live audience since I was nine, so it's not so scary anymore. It's just kind of like fun, but yeah. yeah. There. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Great question. We've got a question up here on microphone number three, all the way up top on the right. Hi there. Hi, James. My name's Angela. Hey, Angela. Um, my little daughter was named after a character in Buffet. It wasn't Buffet. She's called Faith. Okay, right on. Good one. From another Slayer, yeah. Um, I've got two questions. The Spike English accent, whereabouts in England would you say the accent's from? <laughs> it's supposed to be London. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. No. Someone said, someone said, <laughs> I, I was like, how's my English accent? He's like, oh, it's pretty good. It's just I can't tell where you're from. I thought that the whole way through Buffet, but yeah. now I finally got to ask. <laughs> Um, my second question, similar to the other ladies, um, my little girl, she's just started doing acting, drama, performing arts. Um, what's the hardest bit about being an actor or an actress in the world today? It's changed a lot since probably Buffy because of social media and things. But what advice could you give her about what's probably the hardest thing to overcome? The hardest thing for me is that I have to wait for an entire machine to be built before I get to do my art. It's the great thing about being a musician. I don't have to wait for anyone. I just kind of pick up my guitar and play, and I can do my art. But as an actor, I have to wait. Whether it's a play or a movie or a television show, I have to wait for an entire thing to be built before I get to go. And that's frustrating, mm. you know? That, that really... Uh, hampers things and it's all it's probably why I write you know uh if no one's calling for me to act uh, I'll just go sit down and write something because I could kind of be creative doing that um that's kind of it Thank you know you. the payoff is the payoff though is that like this is the thing the personality that we all have that we think we are it's not really us it's just it's a coping mechanism to deal with the, the, the events of our lives. And if the, if, the, the, if the experiences that we have had were any different, we would have coped differently and we would have a very different personality. Like a psychologist would tell you this. And so we have a lot of different facets to our personality, but we could have so much more. Acting allows me to experience things and, and look and parts of myself and develop facets safely that normal life wouldn't get me uh, the ability to do. So you get to kind of know yourself really well as an actor because you've been through all sorts of experiences that, that real life, you, you would die if you had that experience, but in acting you get to have it. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Question over here, uh, microphone number four, top left. Hiya. Hi. Um, I'm August, I've met you twice, yeah. James, <laughs> okay. today. Um, I just, I've been a bit starstruck today, so I wondered if I could do my Drusilla impression for you. Oh, do it, do it, do it, do it, yeah. Spike? It's not moving, Spike. <laughs> That's awesome! Thank you. Why did you go out with the chaos demon? <laughs> Why you leave me with a mucus demon, Drew? It's not you fair. You're boring, Spy. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> you were too busy thinking about that Slayer. Well, I was dreaming. I wasn't touching it. You know, you can look, but you can't touch. That's, a, you know, I was true. You went out with the chaos, Dave. It's your fault. No, it's not. You should have been nicer, Spy. <laughs> You are awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And scene. That was amazing. Thanks. I've been scaring my girlfriend with it for like two weeks. <laughs> Kick ass. Thank you so much. Give her another round of applause. Yeah. We're giving you theater here. We're giving you scene study here at Liverpool Comic Con. We've got a question over here at microphone number one on the right. Hiya. Hi, James. I'm Serena. Hey, Serena. Hi. Um, so, 
I watch Buffy not with my mum, but with my dad. It was my usual Friday night sort of thing. Um, I guess the question I've got is, how much peroxide did you go through during <laughs> Buffy? <laughs> That was the only part that kind of sucked. Like it says on the bottle of bleach that you only can do this every six weeks because it's just not safe. And we did it every eight days. Oh, God. Because like, as they explained to me, a vampire is dead, so your hair can't grow, so you can't have roots. So we're going to have to bleach you at the top of every episode fresh. And... So we were pouring bleach on top of the wounds from the last bleaching all the time. And it was hellaciously painful, I've got to say. I would just, they put the bleach in and, and I would just like go back to my trailer and just like curl up in the fetal position. Like, it's worth it, it's worth it. <laughs> and then like, like about four days after a bleaching, I would comb my hair and the scalp would just lift up into the comb. Oh, no. It was disgusting. Disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for the visual. Thanks glamorous for the Glamorous life. It's a glamorous life. Yeah, so really glam. Yeah. We've got a question here uh, at number two from this lovely Cobra Kai. So, someone wrote my question earlier because I was going to ask you to sing, but well, have you watched Cobra Kai? <laughs> I have watched a little Cobra Kai, but I'm a gamer, man. And so. I, I don't have time for television. <laughs> the new God of War came out, man. Like, yeah. So, out of all the episodes you've watched out of it so far, who is your favorite character? The one that you're cosplaying. Yeah. Yay! Good answer. That's right. <laughs> he said good answer. Give it up for his cosplay, everybody. <laughs> He's ready for Cobra Kai coming up next. <laughs> We've got a question up here, number three, top right. Hi there. Hi, James. I'm Molly. And my question is, who was the nicest person um, on the set and who was the rudest person on the set? <laughs> oh. Coming in the up. nicest person was Tony Head. By far. Yeah. He was the oldest, oldest, so he's the most mature, you know. But he's also just an incredible person. He was also the best actor on the set. Uh... I remember when I first shot with Tony, I was coming from the stage where you're kind of big, you know, and I was getting away with it because I was a vampire, but frankly, I was too big. And I shot with Tony, and I thought, man, old man, wake up. I'm going to mop the floor with you today. And then I saw the, sh the scene, and he killed it, man. Like, the only person I wanted to watch was, was Giles. I didn't care about Spike, because Spike was lying. Giles was being real, you know, and I realized that I had to learn how to act all over again. So I, I went back to the school of Tony Head and I studied what he did and what he didn't do. Um, most importantly, what he didn't do. He didn't act. He just kind of was, he just, he just existed and let, let the camera document something real happening. Um, the rudest person, I will not tell you. This is the thing. I have been... You know how soldiers won't tell you everything that happened in battle because, like, unless you've been in battle, you just won't understand, you know? I feel that's a kind of, like, and now it, it's, it's, an, it's kind of similar in that I've been to war with, these, with the cast. The, the enemy was time, and time always won. It always took something. It always, like, we had these scripts that were so good that you were never going to get, you were never going to be as good as the script. You'd always like, we'd always film something and then read the scene back and there was just some bit of business, some thing that was described that we didn't have time to get into. We always missed something. It was always a letdown. We always failed. And, and there was so much pressure. I don't know how to say this, but like when the scripts are that good, there's so much pressure to try to make, to live up to them. We all felt it. And we were all filming 14, 16, 18, 20 hours a day. We were all so tired. Um, and so I've seen the best and the worst in all of them. I feel like they're really my, like family. And I love them dearly. And I'm not going to tell stories about when they were rude. No way. And I hope they don't tell on, tell on me either. Because, you know, like we were, we're human beings. We're human beings. We're trying our best. But we're human. Yeah. 
you. We have time for one final question. If you guys do not get your question answered here, the great news is James is going to be here for the rest of day two. Sunday, fun day, Liverpool Comic Con. You can come to his booth and get an autograph and ask him the questions in person. But we're going to have one final question here at microphone four up on the top left. Hello. Hi, uh, hi James. Uh, my name's Isla, and um, I'm going to embarrass myself a little bit here and say when I was a teenager, I was exploring my um, LGBT identity and then put myself into the closet, but you are one of the people that was a big part of that, Spike in particular. Um, yeah. Big ass. <laughs> sorry. Um, and, um, You're welcome. <laughs> Um, and I, uh, of course, there is obviously your infamous uh, moments with yourself and John Barrowman yeah. um, and things like that. But I would like to ask you if you could do me a favor today. So today is Transgender Day of Remembrance, and it's a day where basically we remember trans people who uh, have died in particular because of violence. And you've talked a lot about people being themselves and being true to themselves. And I was wondering if you could just show some support and love to the trans community today, if that would be, uh, if that would be all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am so glad there is a transgender remembrance day. You know, I think that I think in my life, my journey has been to try to discover myself, be honest about who I am, and and try to live that truth out in the world without shame. And and for myself, it's been a long journey. And I'm very lucky because generally speaking, what I am is accepted. You know, and, and for trans people, that's just not true. And how do, how, do you, how do you be truthful? How do you live your truth and be proud of it when so much of the world is shaming you or attacking you? And I don't think that we are really going to be free until we're all free. And so I give all my support to the transgender community. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. That touched me. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. That's amazing. Um, any final thoughts for your amazing fans in Liverpool here? They're so supportive and they love you so much. Any final words for you? Go back to your team. You guys are beautiful. <laughs> I'm so glad to be with you all, man. Thanks so much. Give it up one more time for James Marsters. He's heading to the autograph and photo shoot area. Thank you for your questions. Amazing as always. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Amazing questions.